Hello, everyone, and welcome back. For those of you who are joining me for the first time, my name is, of course, Michael Granado. I am a history and philosophy educator, and today I'm going to be reviewing a video, a debate that happened between Alex O'Connor and Ben Shapiro. The focus of this review is not so much to dissect the debate or to determine who I think was right or wrong in the debate, but is really just to break down the first section of Ben Shapiro's presentation when he talked talks about what he calls the atheist delusion and his argument specifically utilizing the concept of free will. Now, the title of the debate, the, the topic of the debate is, is religion good for society or can society be held together if people believe different things or does society require kind of a, a substratum of belief for everyone to share in order for it to function properly or however you want to phrase that. But the first part of what Ben Shapiro talks about doesn't have too much to do with that question per se, but really has to do with uh, kind of objections that he has to a sort of naturalistic or materialistic worldview. It's not really clear what the purpose of the first sort of argument is supposed to, what the function of it is, but that's kind of where he starts off. I guess we can reframe that as is that these are ideas that he believes are important to civilization as a whole. He'll kind of make the argument that belief in free will is important for people in general. But that being said, again, we're not really critiquing Shapiro's or O'Connor's argument as a whole, but really I'm going to be critiquing how Shapiro presents this notion of free will and what he says about free will. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Spoken on, and Alex, you have responded to this idea of the atheist delusion. Ben, could you sort of concisely, if you can, um, talk about what you mean by the atheist delusion? Sure. So I should start off by saying I don't actually think that it's possible to prove the existence of God. I'm also not a believer that you can disprove the existence of God. I don't think that logical argumentation is going to get you there one way or another. And so I'm not going to try and do that with, with Alex today because I think that if people would have been able to provide dispositive proofs, then people would believe them. And if people were able to provide dispositive proofs that God does not exist, then people would be more apt to believe those as well. The, what I think is a, an atheist delusion is that it is possible to live ideologically purely in a way that does not rely on fundamental faith principles. When I say faith principles, I'm not going to make the claim that those faith principles are direct from Sinai or that those faith principles require the New Testament, for example. I'm going to make the claim that there are a bunch of principles upon which we base ourselves that are external to what we know about nature and evolutionary biology. And that many of the things that Alex does in his daily life, for example, are going to be things that rely on principles that are external to a philosophy that would assume a lack of the supernatural, a lack of the, the extra natural. Um, so some of those principles, for example, are free will. So every day we get up, we believe, virtually all of us, whether we whether we say we believe it or not, we actually act in ways that that betray the idea that we believe that we have control over our own actions, at least to a certain extent, and that that control makes a difference in the world. And that's what gives us purpose. It's what allows us to wake up in the morning and, and make the decision to do what we believe is right or what we believe is wrong, that the principles of right and wrong are external to evolutionary biology. Okay, so Shapiro will go on to outline um, some other examples aside from free will that he believes are external to the natural process, external rooted or grounded in something outside of the natural world. He brings up morality, the idea of right and wrong. He also brings up the idea of truth and the idea of reason. But most of the conversation, at least in this first section, tends to focus on free will. So that's what I'm going to focus on here. Okay, so the idea of the atheist delusion that Shapiro presents, he kind of summarizes it as a question. Uh, is it possible to live ideologically purely, whatever that means, I guess, consistently, ideologically consistently, in a way that does not rely upon fundamental principles of faith. Principles of faith, I, I think he takes it as, as sort of um, an epistemology, what we would call properly basic beliefs, ideas that can't necessarily be rationally justified, but that need to be assumed in order for certain other assumptions to get off the ground, so to speak. Shapiro says, quote, these principles upon which we base ourselves that are external to what we know about nature and evolutionary biology. So they exist kind of are an or and or are grounded outside of 
the natural world. Shapiro's argument is that we need these things in order to ground certain assumptions, in order to ground certain worldviews. In this case, the argument that he's presenting, I think, is a form of presuppositionalism. Now, presuppositionalism is typically a position that you see within certain branches of Christian apologetics. Of course, Shapiro is not a Christian. He is Jewish, obviously. But pre the, the presuppositionalist position asserts that everyone has certain basic assumptions or presuppositions. These are kind of fundamental beliefs that shape our worldview and that upon which our worldview is grounded. The main idea of this line of argumentation is that one's starting assumptions, these starting beliefs or presuppositions, ultimately determine our reasoning and interpretation of evidence. For example, presuppositionists also oftentimes argue that belief in the existence of God is somehow necessary, a necessary foundation for rationality or the intelligibility of the world. Conversely, they often contend that non-Christians, in this case Shapiro is arguing that Alex O'Connor, because he is an atheist, I believe, is inconsistent or can't account for certain things, in this case free will, or that he would not be able to account for free will. And this is where it gets a little confusing because O'Connor's not arguing for free will, but Shapiro is using this in a positive sense in that the existence of free will support his, supports his worldview rather than supports Alex's worldview. Also, I'm not sure that I would really want to lump Shapiro as into the category of a presuppositionalist. It's a form of presuppositionalism that's different from the presuppositionalism that you see in Christian apologetics because Shapiro is arguing for a sort of, uh, I guess I would call it a cultural presuppositionalist. In this sense, he's in line with other people such as uh, Jordan Peterson, even people who he would fundamentally disagree with, at least theologically, like Sam Harris, who's an atheist. They all argue that, and I call it cultural presuppositionalism in the sense that they all argue for a kind of a Western-centric worldview, that we need certain basic Western assumptions in order to get society off the ground and in order to maintain society. So I, I, I separate Shapiro from Christian apologists in the sense that one, first and foremost, he's not a Christian, of course, but also the operating value here is not theological, but I think is overtly political. But again, the central idea here is that these ideas, ideas like free will, do not exist in the context of a purely materialist, that is, atheist universe. So those are Shapiro's own words. So Alex's kind of response to this, and again, we're not really going to delve into the arguments that are presented, but Alex's response is that Shapiro's presenting some sort of argument for the existence of God based on the belief in, based on Shapiro's belief in free will. And Alex summarizes this position that if there is no God, then free will doesn't exist. And so by positing free will, he's saying that Shapiro is sort of putting some sort of positive argument for the existence of God. Now, we've already introduced a lot of different philosophical terms that have a very long and lengthy history. We're going to get into some of that, but um, in the true spirit of philosophy, I do think we need to clarify some of these concepts. But before we do that, I'm going to show you a little bit more of the dialogue so we can kind of get some more context about what's happening here. I mean, to, to slightly curve that or to, to kind of sand off the, the rough edges there, I would say that the argument I made is, is an argument for something extra natural. Sure. Now you can call okay. that God or not God, but, but, the, but the, the thing that I'm making the argument for is that you cannot get from a materialist Darwinist universe to yes. free will. That is not possible. So I know that the way you solve that is that you say that there is no free will. That's right. And what I'm saying to you is you don't act that way. Okay, again, Alex's position is that somehow having the existence of God solves the problem of free will or that we're able to explain free will if God exists. And he characterizes Ben's position as, quote, if there is no God, then free will doesn't exist. Shapiro is comes back to that by saying that free will is an argument for something that is, quote, extra natural or beyond the natural process, or beyond natural explanations. Alex's response to that is to support a philosophical position that is known as determinism, in which he basically argues that we are biological machines reacting to our internal and evolutionary drives. Now, like I said, 
lots of terminology and jargon being thrown around here. So let's go ahead and get into some good definitions. So within philosophy, arguments surrounding the existence of freedom or the availability of freedom to the individual, that's a weird way of phrase it, the ability of the individual to freely act, I guess is what I should have said, can roughly be divided into, we got three basic camps here, three basic positions, free will, determinism, and compatibilism. Now we have a definition of free will here from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which says that free will is to say that an agent has free will is to say that the agent has the, ca the capacity to choose his or her course of action, the ability, the freedom to make decisions. Simply put, free will refers to the concept that individuals have the capacity to make choices and decisions independent of external constraints, what we would call deterministic outcomes. It is the ability to act in accordance with one's own intentions, desires, or reasons without being causally determined by factors that are outside of our control. These factors outside of our control can be our environment, our genetics, or even a theological entity such as God. The debate over free will is oftentimes intertwined with discussions about determinism, which posits that every event, including human actions, is predetermined by preceding events or conditions. So the definition of determinism that we have here taken from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, determinism is, roughly speaking, the idea that every event is necessitated by antecedent events and conditions together with the laws of nature. Now, Shapiro's argument is kind of different from typical philosophical arguments because it is explicitly grounded in uh, kind of metaphysical assumptions, grounded in theological commitments about the existence of God, that the will is something given to human beings by God, whereas Alex is arguing for a form of what I would think would be biological determinism in which humans are simply reacting to their genetic dispositions. Now, this is not really a area of philosophy that I'm super comfortable with, um, oh, and I, I forgot to add, there is a third position, and according to a recent survey that was done amongst philosophers, this is actually the most popular position. It's a position known as compatibilism, um, which is the thesis that free will is compatible <laughs> with determinism, so it takes the, the best of both worlds, so to speak. But like I was saying, this is not really an area of philosophy that I'm super comfortable with. It's outside of my area of expertise, of course. Um, but I do think there are some basic issues with Shapiro's argument rooted solely in how he's presenting this notion of free will. So my objection to Shapiro's opening position here, I would say is more methodological rather than philosophical or theological. I'm objecting here to how he's using the concept. So first and foremost, I think what Shapiro should have done from the get-go, and this is standard practice in philosophy, if you're going to use a term or if you're going to build an argument based around a central idea, you really need to offer a clear definition of what you mean by that. So what exactly does Shapiro mean by free will? What is he referring to? Now, secondly, and most importantly, this is related to the first, but what is it about free will that makes it inherently non-naturalistic? Why does free will somehow fall out uh, outside of the realm of naturalistic explanations? Now, we got another term that I need to introduce that I just used to live up to my own expectations here. So Shapiro is consistently objecting to the use of naturalism or naturalism as a worldview. Now, naturalism, this is a definition by the philosopher Quine. Naturalism is the recognition that it is within science itself, not in some prior philosophy that reality is to be identified and described. We could draw the distinction, and this is kind of falls outside of the realm of this video, between uh, ontological naturalism and methodological naturalism. Uh, ontological naturalism is the position that only natural things exist, so we exclude the existence of the supernatural, supernatural entities like God or the soul, for example. 
which is different from methodological naturalism. Now, methodological naturalism is an approach within the philosophy of science and within science itself, I would say, that holds that scientific inquiry should be conducted on the basis of naturalistic principles. It is a stance that seeks to understand the natural world and to explain through phenomenon through natural causes and regularities, excluding supernatural or metaphysical explanations. And, and what this means is if you look at what most people would identify as scientific explanations. So if you go into your biology class and you're looking to ask a question like, why do certain animals behave in certain ways? Well, the explanation, the answer to that question is going to appeal to that animal's, you know, anatomy, natural environment, uh, the ecosystem in which they live. In other words, it's it's offering explanations which appeal to the natural world. And this has been the kind of met basic methodological assumption of science since the early scientific revolution. And what Shapiro is saying here is that you can't, well, I don't know if he would say you can't, is that free will is beyond naturalistic explanations, that we can't account for free will through naturalistic language. And I'm really surprised that Alex didn't call him out on that. But uh, back to Shapiro here. So for a long time, this question of freedom was intimately linked with theological concerns. I just realized I've been sharing full screen and you couldn't see my ugly mug here. I apologize or don't apologize for that. Maybe I should be fully full screen. Um, anyway, it, th this debate between free will and determinism is one of these debates that really goes all the way back to the beginning of philosophy. And again, you see this in different traditions, such as the Greek and the Chinese tradition. People have been having this discussion since people have been having philosophical discussions. But for a long large period of history, this debate was largely framed as a metaphysical question, one which had overt theological implications, because oftentimes the question was asked uh, whether or not we are free with respect to God, that is, whether or not God gave people the freedom to make their own decisions, or whether or not God had preordained the outcome of historical events or the outcome of, within the Christian tradition, the outcome or the destiny of people's souls, for example. That's the sort of free will versus determinism debate and Calvinism's reference throughout this discussion. Now, my uh, 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 to clarify, my objection here is not to say that Shapiro's not right in asking this as a theological question, but my objection is like there are naturalistic philosophers and scientists who talk about free will without talking about theology. So the idea that we can't offer a naturalistic explanation like we have offered naturalistic explanations for, for free will. This is leaving aside whether or not you believe that free will exists, whether or not you're a determinist or a compatibilist. To, to say that you can't give this sort of explanation is to ignore the, all of the research in the case of philosophy is to ignore a lot of philosophy that's been happening over hundreds of years. In the case of the natural sciences is to ignore all of the developments in science that's been taking place over the past 150 years. So that the claim itself is just kind of absurd to me. So is it possible to offer a naturalistic account of free will? Yeah, of course it is. Uh, it's not like a secret that it is. And this isn't some sort of like controversial position. And let me show you some examples from some papers that I found that are doing just that. Okay, just to show you what I'm talking about here, first up, we have this paper titled A Proposal for a Scientifically Informed and Instrumentalist Account of Free Will and Voluntary Action. Just to read a short, I know reading academic articles is riveting YouTube comment, but you know, uh, I'm more so an academic channel, I suppose. But just from the abstract, it says, some claim that neuroscience research challenges the existence of free will slash voluntary action. Within neuroscience, they don't really use the 
same philosophical language that we use. Oftentimes you see discussions around voluntary action. That's why it's using that here. While some who adopt stronger eliminative stance have gone as far as describing free will as an illusion. Contrary to that, those relying on realist stances have restated the foundational value of the role of folk psychological concepts of voluntary action and free will in, for example, the domains of ethics and law. An emerging body of research in cognitive science and social psychology has generated results suggesting that the phenomenon captured by concepts describing free will and voluntary action are dynamic and responsive to priming and framing effects. We propose that this body of research suggests the existence of dynamic and consequential properties of free will better captured following pragmatist theory and instrumentalist epistemology. So if you'll notice, there's no appeals to theology. There's no appeals to grounding this concept of free will in God. This is a naturalistic philosophical slash psychological account of free will. We got another example here, and I'll link all these papers in the description of this video, free will determinism and epiphenomenalism. And the conclusion of this paper, in other words, this paper argues that we don't have any good empiric sci empirical scientific reasons to believe that human beings don't possess non-epiphenomenal libertarian sort of free will. So this paper is outlining the claim that science precludes the existence of free will. This paper is saying that it doesn't. It's got more of a philosophical bent to it. From a more psychological perspective, talking about whether or not going back to that process of decision making that if that occurs within the brain, we have another paper, an algorithmic model of decision making in the human brain. The conclusion of this paper says, quote, it is well known that the decision making process results from the communication between the prefrontal cortex, working memory and the hippocampus, long term memory. However, there are other regions of the brain that play essential roles in the decision making process or in making decisions, I should say. Sorry, adding words to this paper. But their exact mechanisms of actions are still unknown. In this study, we model those mechanisms with NPC, yada, yada, yada. I'll, I'll link the paper if you would like to read it. But the point here is that free will is oftentimes associated with our abilities to make decisions outside of external control. And here we have a psychological model for decision making, a psychological model that is purely naturalistic. And one more paper titled Free Will and Neuroscience from Explaining Freedom of Way to the New Ways of Operationalizing, Operationalizing, did I say that wrong? Operationalizing? I'll have to look that up. Uh, and measuring it. So this paper says the concept of free will is hard to define, but crucial to both individual and social life. For centuries, people have wondered how freedom is possible in a world ruled by physical determinism. However, reflections on free will have been confined to philosophy until half a century ago when the topic was also addressed by neuroscience. Surprise, surprise. The article therefore proposes to start from an authorizational account of free will. I'm sorry if I'm saying that word wrong. Forgive me, YouTube. To find a connection between the higher order descriptions useful for practical life and the neural basis, this new way to conceptualize free will should be linked to the idea of capacity. Okay, again, the, the purpose of me sharing that is to fundamentally to rebut Shapiro's claim that free will represents a mechanism or an entity that is somehow extra natural. I'm rebutting that. I just showed you uh, five, six different examples in which we have naturalistic explanations for free will. I'm not sure if it's just that Shapiro is not familiar with this sort of literature, but there is a whole body of philosophy, psychology, neuropsychology, bio evolutionary biology that talks about and relating this loose, loosely speaking, this concept of free will and offering naturalistic explanations for it. He'll also, Shapiro will go on to make some strange claims about uh, not really strange. We'll make some claims about belief in free will and why it's beneficial. I'll encourage you to go look at that body of literature yourself. We get sort of a misrepresentation. I might make a, a, a different video on this in the future if y'all are interested in that sort of thing. Anyway, um, I just watched the first like 15, 20 minutes of this discussion and said, I, I got to make a, a video on this. Well, Thank you for watching. Thanks for stopping by. Let me, did you watch the debate? Let me know what you thought, uh, who you thought won the debate, whether or not you agree with Shapiro or O'Connor. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section below, and I will see you all next time.